Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord this evening. Good to see all of you. You ready for some good preaching tonight? Ready for some good singing? I got one announcement before we start. There's a blue F-150 Ford truck parked in front of the back entrance gates. And our gates, uh, uh, our, our buses are trying to get through. Our kids are getting back from games and they can't get through because your truck's in the way. Um, so we're all going to stay seated and we want to see who stands up and runs yes, out right yes, now. Yes, 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 yes. So yes. just look real quick. No, but we need, if you could get that for us, our buses are trying to get through there and it's blocked. So we'll have everybody stand together so no one will see anybody go out. And get a songbook and uh, Ron will lead us in a number this evening. Have you had a good day? Hey, Amen. I'm telling you, it was sweet, sweet this morning. Sweet as honey. And uh, good this evening, thank God. Good to have Brother Cal Ray. Good to have you that are visiting. And I hope that if you're here for the first time that you understand um, this is camp meeting. And it's, it's just a different time. And we praise the Lord for the freedom. Don't you love freedom of the Spirit? Love the Spirit of the Lord. I praise God. You know, we've been studying. Brother Tom, Tom Malone is a preacher and a half. He preached last Wednesday. On First Corinthians, and it has thrilled us because we had just been through. We're now in Second Corinthians, and you know, we were just studying this weekend, and first time I ever noticed it says that we are given the earnest of the Spirit. The earnest. Earnest. And you know, it just sounded good, but looking it up, you know what McGee said, J. Vernon McGee said, if you're going to buy something, you pay it down, but you pay an earnest. You give them earnest money. And it's you're looking for something better. It's bigger and better. We just got a little bit of it. You know that? We just got, we just put down money on something. Thank God it's going to get bigger and better. And I'm glad for the earnest of the spirit that's here with us. We'll have new bodies then. You know that? We can stand it. Bless God. Bless God. Page 167. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Are you happy? Yes. Are you full up to here? Have you had uh, plenty of good food and uh, what was best? What do you like best? I like the potatoes. I like them taters. <laughs> Joy unspeakable. Page 167. Sing with all your heart. Here we go. Sing it pretty now. I found his grace. Oh, 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 
Clyde. Brother Clyde, pray for the offering, please. Well, the offering goes to Brother Cal Ray, goes to Evangelistic Outreach. I'm telling you, a worthy, worthy uh, organization. We love them and have for 50 years, so we praise God for, for them and their work. Got a new building in New Boston. I'm telling you, it's beautiful. Thank the Lord for the work there that goes on. And so this is, this is for Evangelistic Outreach. Brother Cal. is uh, evangelistic outreach night. Uh, I thought this afternoon it's hard to believe we've been having the privilege to uh, give these scholarships for nine years now. Wow. Nine years. And uh, they're given in honor of uh, Brother Calvin and Sister Doris Evans. Brother Calvin was the founder of evangelistic outreach and his dear wife, uh, Sister Doris, they, they were precious friends, our family, yes, they were. many, many years. Uh, uh, they, they attended here in the, in the winter months when they would come, come down to vacation for a little while. And uh, always such an encouragement to us. That, to be honest with you, they were role models. Faithful, humble servants of God who've gone on to, to be with the Lord. And yet their ministry that they started continues to see people saved. Continues to uh, encourage the people of God. Continues to impact, and I mean literally people all around the world yes. and I, I believe when you think of what uh, they did in their lives I, I really think of what Jesus talked about in John chapter 15 about fruit that remains yeah. even after you're long gone yeah. then that's what it is and right. you know you, you you think of brother Calvin you think of sister Doris and and I think Bible characters can kind of come to to mind you know when I think of sister Doris I, I'll be honest with you I think of Ruth that's who I think of and, and, and when you consider the sacrifice and the faithfulness and commitment she made as the wife of a very busy evangelist, 
I mean, Brother Cal went like Cal Ray and Brian go all over the world, night after night. And, and, and when I think of what she did, those words ring in my ears of what Ruth said to Naomi. Whether thou goest, I will go. Whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. So I, I think of Ruth. When you think of Brother Calvin, there's a lot of Bible characters, to be honest with you, that can come to mind. But the one that I, I spoke on just a few weeks ago, so that's probably the, the freshest in my mind, is, is Caleb. This is what the Bible says about Caleb. Six different times in the Bible says the same phrase about him. He wholly followed the Lord. Holy. That means all of him. God had all of him. He wholeheartedly followed the Lord. And the thing about Caleb's life was this. His faithfulness all through those years of marching in the wilderness, which, by the way, he didn't commit the sin, but he had to help pay the punishment. You know what I'm talking about? Year after year, he marched, and he kept hold of that promise from the Lord. And he remained faithful all those years. And you get to the end of his life, and because he was faithful... You know who ends up benefiting in Joshua chapter 15? His kids benefit. His children benefit. And because of the faithfulness of the life of Calvin Evans, our children in this church have benefited. They benefit year after year. And I thought, I want to do this for I introduced the recipients this year. If you have won a scholarship, if you've, been, if you've received one the last nine years or your kids have, would you mind standing for me real quick? If you have received one, or your kids have received one, or your grandkids have received one, would you stand, please? And this is just a handful of them. Just a handful of them. You can be seated. So we appreciate brother and sister uh, Calvin and Doris Evans. It's our honor to do this every year to remember them. Thank you for those who contributed. Uh, if, you, if you didn't, you can still do that. And what we're able to do is we're able to give three students in our school a scholarship for the upcoming year to, to go. And uh, you can ask the parents how much of a blessing that is yes, and what an encouragement it is. So what I want to do is I want to give these to Brother Calvin. And as you come up, as your kids will come up, just come up here and shake his hand, and we, we'd like to honor you. The first recipient this year for the Calvin and Doris Evans Memorial Scholarship is Miss Chloe Dennison. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. May have to come with her. Our second recipient for this year's uh, Calvin and Doris Evans Scholarship, Ms. Brooke Means. We usually try to give one to a, a preschool or elementary and then one middle school. And so uh, the third one for our high school goes to Mr. Leo Vieira. There's no student speeches. <laughs> but thank you for your donations. 
And I, again, I want to thank uh, Cal and Brian. Uh, they always make a sizable contribution every year. And uh, they're, they're, they're an encouragement, a ministry of encouragement they are. And so we thank you. God bless you. Amen. We'll ask Mike, Teresa, and Shane to come. They're going to sing for us tonight. Give them a hand as they come to minister to us. I say praise the Lord. Amen. That's wonderful right there. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. I see all these young people get up here and sing. And we the old folk now. But... Uh, Somebody said, you don't jump as high as you used to. I ain't as young as I used to be, but I still got the fire. Amen. Bless God. I think this song right here is spinning for what's just took place, what's taking place, what's going to take place. Let's sing it now. Oh, bless the Lord. Yes, bless the Lord. Well, bless his holy name. Let me not forget all the benefits or the blessings that he brings. I'm lifting up my hands to the great I am. Lord. Let me never be ashamed with all that is within me now. Oh, bless his holy name. Now Jesus is to me my everything, and I bless the day he came. When he gave me drink from the fountain sweet, said I'll never thirst again. Now through the Spirit of the Son to the Father I can say, for your saving blood and for all you've done, bless your holy and sweet name. Oh, bless the Lord, yes, bless the Lord, well, bless his holy name. Let me not forget all the benefits or the blessings that he brings. I'm lifting up my hands to the great I am. Let me never be ashamed with all that is within me now. Oh, bless his holy name. Someday I'll move beyond the blue where a better home awaits. Yeah. There to lay aside for a crown of life all the sorrow, death, and pain. To see my loved ones and to know I've left this world behind. I will lift my hands and I'll bless his name while I'm shouting through the sky. Oh, bless the Lord, yes, bless the Lord. Well, bless his holy name. Let me not forget all the benefits or the blessings that he brings. I'm lifting up my hands to the great I am. Let me never be ashamed with all that is within me now. Oh, bless his holy name. Sing that chorus. Name. Oh, bless the Lord. Yes, bless the Lord. Well, bless his holy name. Let me not forget all the benefits or the blessings that he brings. I'm lifting up my hands to the great I am. Let me never be ashamed with all that is within me now oh bless his holy name i'm lifting up my hands to the great i am let me never be ashamed with all that is within me now oh bless his holy name the Lord, yes, bless the Lord, well, bless his holy name. Let me not forget all the benefits or the blessings that he brings. I'm lifting up my hands to the great I am. Let me never be ashamed with all that is within me now. Oh, bless his holy name. above all names it's wonderful to me it's the only name that has the power to set my spirit free so i'm gonna give him glory i'm gonna give him all the praise so i've got to stand and testify and magnify his name there's no other name like jesus 
so greatly to be praised. I love the name of Jesus, for he washed my sin away. There is power in the name of Jesus. He's the one who died to save us. There's no other name, no other name like Jesus. He's the one who died to save us. There's no other name, no other name like Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Power in the name of Jesus. He's the one who died to save us. There's no other name, no other name like Jesus. There's no other name, no other name like Jesus. Like Jesus. Days is not that long. 
was low when the river was wide. So I want to thank Him and I want to praise Him one more time. When the valley was full, when the river was wide, so I want to thank Him and I want to praise Him one more
think I'll just thank him and I'll just praise him one more time. some honey and we've had some seed and we've had some stones and now I'm listening for a word from God tonight from one of the greatest preachers you will ever hear in your life. Would you make welcome Dr. Cal Ray Evans as he preaches for us. What a tremendous, tremendous place to be. My how God has blessed the camp meeting this year. I don't know how we could ask the Lord for more but I will say this. Lord, if you give us more, you'll give us more capacity to hold it. Just a tremendous meeting already, what God has done. Oh, God is so good. And you know, if Dad was here tonight, I know that, uh, that the first thing that he would want me to say for him is thank you to this church. For many, many years ago, seeing the need for meetings like this in this country. And you have paid the price, and I appreciate so much Brother Roger Duncan and all the people in the early years of this ministry and church for what you've done. Roger, thank you for being my friend. Thank you for doing what you have done. I think you all let him know you appreciate him, folks. He tries to hide out back there, but God sees him. Bless you, Roger. Bless these wonderful people for following the vision that God gave many years ago. And I not only thank God for that, but I want to make this clear. I praise God for Will and for Hoy and the people here right now that's carrying on the vision and doing such great, great work in these days and this generation. You ought to let these folks know you appreciate them. Many of us come in and visit all week long and they take care of everything for us. Would you let this pastor, assistant pastor know and all the people here at First Free Will Baptist Church at Tampa, let them know that you love them, appreciate them and give God glory for what they have done. God bless your heart. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. Hallelujah. If you don't like noise and you don't like loud preaching, you're in the wrong place tonight. In fact, you'll wish you were the one that left your car out there to have a reason to leave. But now, if you don't have a reason to leave, 
I got big guys like Mike Perry back there in the back to block you if you try to get out. Hold them in, Mike, hold them in. Make sure they're near death if you let them go. Amen. Thank God. Great, it is wonderful, wonderful to see what God's doing through the school, through the church here. And I don't know if that touched your heart, but to see that last night on the screen, what God has done for them, just about 10 days away from getting in that new building. All we do is complain that young people aren't serving the Lord, that young people aren't doing what's right. Well, you got people here trying to do that. Be a blessing to them. God will bless you for it. Boy, where'd all the amens go? Be a blessing to them. God will bless you for that. I promise you that. I'm not just making that up. That's true. He'll be a blessing. You say, well, preacher, we don't have any youth. That's why you ought to help someone that does. Then God may give you some. I found out if God doesn't, if I don't help others that's in the ministry, how can I, uh, doing things I'm not doing and I don't help them and support them, how can I ask God to bless me in what I'm doing? We ought to reach out to one another. That means out of these singers that's here, you ought to help these other singers. Uh, I thought you were ready for preaching. You ought to help these other people. You, you know, we get picked on so much for reaching out and helping others. Uh, I, I gave the, the state, I give a state of the church address every year to our home church. And last year, the church gave away $351,000 to help other churches and other ministries. That's one local church that God, is, well, you say, I'm not excited about that. How much did you give? 30% of their income they gave. Praise God. Bless the Lord. And you know what we're praying? We're praying God will allow us to double it this year. Thank God, thank God. We had, in December, the church gave $70,000 to help other ministries in December alone. And at the end of the month, we had as much in the checking account as when we started the month. We're in the second poorest county in the state of Ohio. And God, you talk about honey. Brian, I don't mean this bad, but he's not giving us drops of honey. He's giving us buckets of honey. Nobody has any big job or big income. They got a big heart. Well, I better preach. Want to kill a meat and hit them in the pocketbook. <laughs> We've done too much for ourselves too long. Yeah. And if we just live for ourselves, we'll die within ourselves. Yeah. But if we are a blessing to one another yeah. and we see one another in need and reach out, the Bible puts it this way, if we see our brother in need in half of this world's goods and shut up our bowels of compassion, how dwelleth the love of God in you? Well, glory to God. Pull an amen out of your pocket right now. If you don't have one, pull one out of your neighbor's pocket. I didn't come to preach on money, amen, but it feels good. <laughs> Thank the Lord. I'm reading tonight out of the Song of Solomon. You turn there, if you will. The Song of Solomon may take you a little bit of time to find it because it's a book that's not preached out of that often. And I want to just stress this to you uh, that to me, it's one of my favorite books to preach out of in the Old Testament. I have asked the Lord to give me a hundred different sermons out of the Song of Solomon in my lifetime. I'm well on the way of doing that. I've preached so many sermons out of this. Now, if you are not a Christian and you read the book of the Song of Solomon, then it'll seem like a very wicked and distasteful book to you. Because if you look at it through carnal eyes instead of spiritual eyeglasses, it would seem like that it, it is a distasteful book, that you don't understand what God's saying it. But when you get saved and you learn that the church is likened unto a bride and Christ is likened unto a groom. And then you understand, no wonder Solomon said in the very first verse, he said, it is the song of songs. Out of all the songs that he wrote, he said, this is my song. This is the greatest song that I've written because it's really prophetically looking forward to the love relationship that the church has with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you think about the bride as the church, and here they are now, here's this, this, uh, 
this wonderful, wonderful lady that's mentioned in this passage, she takes on the name of Solomon because her name in the Hebrew, Shulamite woman, is the same name as Solomon, the female tense of the male word. So she took on his name before they ever got married. By the way, there's not been a wedding yet. But there's gonna be, and until we get there, I've already decided I've taken on his name. That's why I call myself a Christian. We take on his name before there's ever a wedding. I've I've been blessed to look at this in so many different ways. You see the bride to be in all types of situations. You see the bride under an apple tree. That's where it all started, under a tree. (laughs) On the cross where Jesus died, he said to the bride, this is how much I love you. I love you so much that I'll die for you. You see the bride with the wind blowing on her face. There's nothing like the wind blowing on the bride. Some of you come into these services, you wonder what's wrong with those people? Why are they jumping up like that and screaming and hollering and hooping and shouting? It's just the wind blowing. It's the wind blowing on their face. They're not excited about their trouble. They're not excited about their trials. They're excited about the wedding. They're excited about the day when they'll get to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and see him face to face and they rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You see the bride looking like a lily among the thorns, a picture of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But sad to say, in one chapter you see the bride asleep. I'm afraid we've fallen asleep at the wheel. This thing has lost ground so quickly in this nation and the church has forgotten our priority. Make make sure that the main thing always stays the main thing. There is nothing above sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and there's nothing above reaching the lost and discipling the new convert and fulfilling that great commission that the Lord gave to us as a church. There's no greater duty than that. We also see the bride looking through the lattice. She catches just a glimpse of him. Says, I wanna follow him. You see the bride awakening. You, You see in one chapter, one looking for the other in chapter three, said, by, my, by night on my bed, I saw him, woke up, looked around, couldn't find him, so got up out of the bed, said, I went into the streets, and I began to ask, have you seen him whom my soul loveth? And said, it was a little while that I passed from this until I found him whom my soul loveth. I found him and held him and would not let him go. Boy, that'll preach within itself. I sought him, I found him, I held him, and I will not let him go. That's the way we ought to feel about our love relationship with Christ. The mandrakes that are mentioned in this particular passage came right before the harvest time. That's when they were ripe, when you could smell them the greatest. He's saying that the church needs to have a keen sensitivity in these days as we near the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Am I the only one in this place that feels like something is about to happen? That soon and very soon there will come a shout like the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But out of all the sermons I've preached, this is probably the most strange sermon out of this book. I could not understand it for weeks and months I tried to find anybody that had anything on it. Uh I have literally, and it's it's because of dad, what he passed down to me, what I've accumulated, literally thousands of books. You don't believe that? Just come to our ministry office. And I know Mike Simpson here, he's been in, there's rows, there are books from ceiling to floor, book after book. Nothing about it. Uh Strange. Hard to find. 
Now, I'm not preaching it because it's unique. I'm preaching it because it blessed me. But when I read it, it confused me because I didn't understand the application. He is describing his bride, how beautiful she is, how precious she is, how sweet that she smells, how much that he loves her. And then in verse nine, I want you to read what he compares the bride to. He says, I have compared thee, O my love. Chapter one and verse nine. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. You say, now why are you confused about it? Go home and tell your wife she looks like a horse. (laughs) Tell me the response you get. I mean, when you look at it, and you know what, I try to read things on it, and, and we'll, a lot of commentators, they, they say on this, wise people, they say, really, it's referring to the mare, the mare horse, the special horse that the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, had. But that's not what it says. It's talking about a company of horses in the plural. So God began to deal with my heart. If I could entitle the message tonight anything, I would call it all the king's horses. All the king's horses. There had to be something unique about the horses of the king of Egypt that made them different from other horses. It had to be very precious or he would never have liked it. He's saying this as a compliment and she receives it as the highest compliment. So I begin to look and I begin to read. And and for time's sake, let me just give you three things real quick. Every horse and any horse, you just couldn't go out and pick a horse and say, you're in the king's stallions. You're the king's horse. No, they had to meet three basic qualifications. Number one, the king of Egypt would never have a horse that he had not bought. It had to be a bought horse. You couldn't give it to him. He had to pay for it. If he didn't pay for it, he wouldn't take it. Because if you gave it to him, you may change your mind and want to take it back. But if he paid for it, he had a receipt that said, oh, glory to God, this horse is my horse. I have bought this horse and paid for this horse. I was amazed when I started studying in history. It's hard to find much in Bible commentary, but they actually, he would have a special individual that was known as the overseer of the horses of his majesty. And the overseer was told this by Pharaoh, I don't care how far you have to go. No distance is too great. I don't care how much you have to pay. No price is too high. I want you to get me the best horse that there can be, but I want it to be my horse. I want to own it. I want it to be my property. I don't want it to belong to anybody else. I want it to be my horse. Can I tell you something? The scripture confirms the fact that if we are part of the bride, we have been bought with a price. We have been redeemed. We have been ransomed. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. And you know that's the principle of the word of God. Exodus chapter 30 verses 11 through 16. Before they could number the people, they first had to be a certain age to be redeemed to be ransomed. Now I'm not telling you you have to be a certain age to be saved, but the age, the date, the years is not important. But you'll not be saved till you reach an age of accountability. They have to reach that age where they know that spiritually they have sinned and they need the Lord. Not only was there the age, but also there was the amount. He said it the same for everybody. 
half a shekel of the silver of the treasury of the atonement of the atonement money. He said, uh, you've got to pay for it with silver. And it's the same for everybody. Do you know what? I didn't get saved one way and you get saved another way and you get saved another way. If you're saved and part of the bride, it costs the same price for you to be saved that it costs for me to be saved. Let's get this right. Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It costs God his best. The overseer of his majesty's horses went forth and said, I'll pay the price that they cannot pay that they might be saved and redeemed. He paid the price. Had to be a bald horse. Second of all, it had to also not only be a bald horse, but it had to be a blood horse. (laughs) See, (laughs) what made the horse valuable was the bloodline. (laughs) Would you help me preach? What makes the bride valuable is we were not only bought, but we were paid for with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God I've got the right blood inside of me. There was a price paid when Jesus shed his blood. That blood was the atonement for my sin and for your sin. And if you're saved, you've been saved by the blood and through the blood because of the blood and without the blood we cannot make it to heaven. For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold received by tradition, by the vain conversation of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus as of a lamb without spot and without blemish unto him who loved us and washed us of our sins by his own blood. Oh, there is one that paid the price and he said if you're gonna make it, you've gotta make it through the blood. <laughs> Boy, they about quit preaching on the blood. Talking about the blood of Jesus. Singing about the blood of Jesus. But I'm here to tell you it still stands. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Have you been to Jesus for his cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? It is the blood that makes the difference. Old Sam Jones, that great old Methodist preacher, used to say, I love the blood of Jesus so much and the power of the blood of Jesus is so great that even if a mosquito bites me, have to fly away singing, there's power in the blood. (laughs) Glory to God. Why would he pay such a price? Why would he give his blood to save us? Because when the enemy would come and the enemy would say, you can't have that one. Jesus could say, oh, you wait a minute. That one's mine. I bought them and I paid for them with my own blood. The church of the living God was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not my blood, not your blood but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Well, I go a hundred ways with that, but I do regard your time. You've been here, you've been here service after service, but I gotta hit one more thing. It had to be a bald horse, had to be a blood horse, and there's one other thing the king required. It had to be a broken horse. He did not want any wild horses. He wanted a horse that he could use, a horse that he could ride. See, just because you're broken, that doesn't mean that the devil won. Oh no, when you're broken, you're still the king's horse. 
You're broken so he can use us. We go through lessons in life and we learn things in life and the brokenness in life that comes our way is so that God can use us more effectively with our people every time I counsel one of them, every time I pray with them at an altar, every time I see God restore their home, every time I see God heal their body, every time I see God bring them out of difficult situations, every time I see someone delivered from drugs and alcohol, every time I see the Lord overcome, I remind them the reason God does that is he only asks one thing, that we let him use us for his glory out of our brokenness, out of our ashes. He wants the beauty of all of it. And he says, now you've got to use that for my glory to be a blessing to others. Mike's got this bread everywhere. Always amazed me. Jesus blessed that bread. He blessed something that wasn't enough. They even said, how can so little feed so many? He knew it wasn't enough. (laughs) I don't know why he blesses us. When we look at it, we say, I don't have enough to do that, God. I can't do that, but he goes ahead and blesses what's not enough. He blessed it from somebody that didn't count. There were 5,000 men besides the women and children, but he didn't use a man, he used a lad. They didn't count the children. God will use people that nobody else counts. And the Lord sees them and says, I know nobody else may see what you're going through or know what you're going through. And the world may not count you as much, but the Lord sees something in you that he can use. But the multiplication didn't come when he blessed it. It didn't come when the lad gave it. It came when he broke it. You know the amazing thing about that, Ron? I know you're like me. I believe Jesus knows everything. And just like he knew that would feed everybody there, he also knew when enough was passed out to feed everyone. After they had broken enough, he could have said stop. But he made sure there was an abundance. More than what they needed. Keep passing out. Keep passing it out. Keep passing it out. Now I want to say this to you. The most blessed people that I've run into in my ministries and the places God has brought me, the most blessed people are not always those with the greatest minds the greatest gifts, or the greatest talents. But I tell you who has impacted my life the most, people that have been broken the most. Broken people are still used by the king. And it's the little things that nobody sees. If if you give me time maybe just to share two things, not my testimony, but the testimony of broken people that God's allowed me to meet and boy, I tell you, he blessed me. When I met, I met some of these folks, he's, he's blessed me beyond, beyond my understanding. One morning I got in the hospital early. One of our volunteers at the ministry said they had a friend from down in Kentucky. Said they brought my friend up to the hospital there by the town there that our church is in. Said, if you get a chance, would you go by and see her? She's a great Christian lady. Said, it'll be worth your while, Cal, if you go see her. Said, but they just diagnosed her. She's got cancer again. She's been through cancer, spent the better part of her adult, adult life battling cancer. Uh, <laughs> she's not a <laughs> lady in our church. Wise. She's been broken. Wise, wise lady. Said one time, I'm not a sick Christian trying to get well. I'm a well Christian that the devil's trying to make sick. (laughs) Sometimes when he's working us over, the world will look at us and we'll even start to think ourselves, I can't do anything for God. Broken people. I went in and I expect her to be discouraged since that evening before she got the news 
that she had cancer again. She's taken treatment after treatment, torturous treatments. And I went in and I said, hello, Tammy. Oh, bless the Lord. I am so glad you came. And I thought, they must have told me wrong. She's not distraught. She's not upset. She's doing wonderful. So we talked for a little while. And she's, she shared some kind words with us. She said, I pray for you every day. Pray for you and Brian every day. I said, thank you, sis. That means so much. We talked for a while. And as we talked, I said, I have to tell you, I admire your faith. And she said, can I tell you how God gave me faith? And I said, sure you can. She said, through my mother. My mother died in her 40s and said the better part of my teenage years and growing up, all I could ever remember was my mother battling cancer. Said, I never heard my mother complain one time. I never heard my mother ever one time say, God, why is this on me? Said, I can remember my mother being so sick that we would literally clean her up in the church bathroom where she was nauseated and carry her in and sit down and said she would be walking the floors before she left there. Praising God, nobody know what she's going through. But that cancer kept eating away and finally she started to lose her sight. And she said, the only time I ever heard my mama say anything through all of that brokenness is one day at the altar, I heard her say, dear Jesus, I'm going through everything and I'll go through all of it for your glory and praise you through all of it. But Lord, I have raised my kids by your word and I cannot stand the thought of not being able to read my Bible every day and she said Lord I, I don't care how good I can see I don't know how you're going to do it but would you please allow me until I go to heaven would you allow me to read just a little bit of your word every day she said I'm telling you when my mom prayed that I wasn't where I should be with God and she said it was like an army marching up and down my back because I knew she had touched heaven said the very next day I went to see my mom and this is what she said. She had her Bible open. And she was sitting there staring at it. Couldn't see one word on it. Not a single word. And she stared and she stared and said my mom stared at her Bible for about three hours and said oh glory to God. Bring me a pen, bring me a pen. And said she brought her a pen and said my mom took that pen just like this, held way out there and underlined one verse. Every day of her life, God would give her one verse. Sometimes she'd stare at that for 10 minutes and get it. Sometimes she'd stare at it for three hours and get it. And, and she asked her one day, said, Mom, what happened? She said, child, all I can tell you is I'm saying, Lord, I'm waiting on my verse today. And I'm looking at that book knowing good and well I can't see it. And she said, this was before your time, child. She said, but they used to have silent movies. Said when they had silent movies and something big was about to happen, the words would get real bright on the screen. And she said, out of nowhere, where the word of God just lights up and she said I underline it and I know that's my verse for that day hey. took her in the hospital she was near death about four, five, six days of treatment she started to do better the doctor came in and told the kids your mom's doing better you can take her home tomorrow you probably need to make some arrangements to get that done and she said, uh, we started working on it to get mom home. Said the next day I went in the hospital. Said mom was sitting there. Said it's about the middle of the day. We'd waited later so we'd get everything arranged. Said we went in and said my mom had her Bible folded and on her lap. And she said, uh, we've come to take you home. She said, no, I'm not going home, child. I love you. Said, I'm going to heaven today. 
She said, well, how do you know that, Mom? She said, I stared at this for four hours this morning, and I didn't get a verse. And I asked God, Lord, I don't have a verse. And said, the sweet Holy Ghost told me, you don't need one today. The word will become reality to you. You're gonna see me face to face today. She said, I I knew when mom said that she was going home that day. And she said, I I went out in the hallway trying to explain it to my family and some of them not Christians and not understanding and said when we went back inside, mom had her Bible with her hands folded, a smile on her face, and she was with the Lord. Hey, let me tell you something. God sees your brokenness, but he will not forsake you in the hour of your brokenness, you're his. I, I, I close with this, and this blessed my soul. We were out west in a meeting. A pastor, he's been here to this meeting. We go out there every year, and Brian and I and hold a meeting for him. And we were nearing the end of the meeting, and he's got a young couple. The whole church is filled with young married couples. My, what a service we had that night. The power of God came down and people were being saved. And and what a great, great service. I think eight people saved in the meeting and we were just, we were thrilled to see what God was doing. And he's got one young couple that's been involved in their music program. And after service, him and her called me aside and she said, Preacher, have I told you that my grandmother died. I said, no, I'm so sorry. I hadn't heard, I apologize. She said, oh, no, 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 it's fine. She said, but I knew I'd ask you to pray for my grandmother. And I said, yes, and I had prayed for your grandmother. And she said, well, I gotta tell you, and I caught Brian over to the side and motioned for him to come over. You ever sometimes just feel like something's gonna be so good that you need a witness? She had that glow of glory on her face. And she said, you know, my grandmother had Alzheimer's and said she had lost her mind to the point that she couldn't recognize us most of the time. And she said, I got such a burden for her because I knew she had never made a profession of faith and repented of her sins and she was lost. And said, I started praying. And she wasn't boasting. She looked around, she said, and we started fasting. And she said, Lord, I can't bear the thought of my grandmother dying lost and me serving you in the work of the Lord. She's no better than any other person, but I sure would like to know she's saved. And the Lord just gave her peace, said, bring your grandmother to church. So she made arrangements. Her and her husband went early one Sunday morning, went and got her grandmother, picked her up, took her in on that church and be on the left-hand side about three, four rows back, sat down, and she thought, at first the devil come along, whispered in her ear, you know how she is. She might, she might show herself some yeah. way. And, and she said, I just kept saying, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. No, the Lord told me bring her to church, and that's what I've done. I've done what God has asked me to do. And she said, I just kept rebuking him. And said, my grandmother sat there, and boy, she just nodded her head when they sang said the pastor preached the best message on salvation. Said my grandmother, not even knowing they hadn't got to an invitation song, when he finished, she just stood up and came down to the front. Said he went down to her and said, what do you need? And she said, well, I need to be saved apparently. Said what you tell me, I'm not a Christian. She said, I'm an old woman and all old women need to be saved. She said, I'm getting close to death. I want to know that I'm saved. He took the word of God and took her through the plan of salvation with simple childlike faith. Oh, she said, I can still see my grandmother said tears streaming down her face and her clapping her hands. And she said, I've never had anything that was ever so good in all my life. So we were rejoicing and hugging her and said, got her in the car and got her to the nursing home got her settled in her room and said, she looked at me and she said, sweetheart, I don't know who you are. This is her granddaughter. She said, it's real nice of you to come and visit today. She thought, well, she's tired. Yeah. So she put her in bed. Next day she goes back all night long. You know what the devil did to that little gal? 
See, your grandma didn't get saved. She don't have mine. Let, let's get this right. You're not saved by your mind. You're saved by your faith and the grace of God. I could lose my mind. And if I lose my mind and the time, I'm no better than anyone else. Don't you look pious. You could lose your mind too. But I'll guarantee you this. My heart is fixed on God. And if I lose my mind, the devil might take my mind, but he can't take my soul. My soul is in the hollow of his hand. She went in the next day and the devil beat her up all night long. Said I visited with her for a while. She said I felt so defeated. She didn't know me. She didn't know a family member. And she said I got ready to go. And she said why? Sweetheart, it's so kind of you to come and visit me. I don't know who you are, said, but I'm so glad you gave your time to come and visit. Would you come back? She said, yes. Said, I started to the door and I heard her voice. She said, oh, excuse me, excuse me. She said, I turned around and said, yes. And she said, did I tell you what happened to me yesterday? (laughs) She said, I went to church and this nice young man stood behind this pulpit and told me that Jesus died for my sin. And she said, the Lord Jesus Christ saved my soul and gave me peace in my heart. She said, preacher, grandma's in heaven now till the day she died. She never knew me. She never knew a lot of the family, but she'd tell that same story. Did I tell you what happened to me? I went forward and I asked the Lord to come into my heart and into my life. It doesn't matter how broken we are in body. The Lord says you're still mine and I love you and you belong to me. I bought you and I look at you and say you are a horse of the king. They got to singing tonight. I looked around a lot of people with good bodies. A lot of people, you're good people. But out of all the folks that could have been praising God and really should have been praising God, you say, I don't feel like it. Isn't it funny? They get up all the time and say, you're not saved by your feelings, but we worship by our feelings. Sometimes you gotta worship and praise God by faith. You don't feel like you have two nickels to rub together, but he's still God, still on the throne. I go down by my old buddy, DJ. Thought he was raising his hand. I could tell he's getting a little weary, so I just went down and held his hand up a little while. Mike, you all couldn't hear it. You were getting ready to stop, and he said, oh, don't stop. Just let him praise God a little longer. Isn't that something? The man in here that probably has the greatest difficulty getting his hand up was the first one to get his hand up. So we got him over here raising his hand and Jacob Berry doing merry-go-rounds. He can't get anywhere else so he just goes in a circle right there. And you got Eddie over here that come down the side and walking across the front and hugging everybody. Can I ask you something? Have you ever been through anything in your life? Have you ever been broken? Has the devil ever told you it's over, you're done, you'll never be good for anything? Have you ever had sleepless nights where you wet your pillow with tears? Have you ever been broken in body and then God comes along and does something greater than we'll ever understand? He floods our soul with his sweet spirit and says, I still love you, I care for you, I've not forsaken you, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. They'll come with a song. It was a bald horse. It was a blood horse. And it was a broken horse. He breaks us to use us. If you're here tonight in this service, If you're able to stand, you can stand. If you're not able to stand, we don't expect you to do one thing you're not able to do. But if you're here tonight in this service, 
Maybe you're going through brokenness. You need to come and say, Lord, I need to quit fighting this thing and feeling sorry for myself. And remember, I'm bought with a price. Your blood saved me. Your heads are bowed. I'm gonna take 30 seconds to do this. If you are broken, in body, broken in spirit, if you're going through a broken time in your life and you need encouragement from God, you just raise your hand and say to me and say to the pastor, pray for me. God bless you. God bless you, sis. God bless you, brother. How many others? Just raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, brother. God bless you, brother. Somebody else, just raise your hand. Bless you, brother. God bless you. God bless you. Somebody else up in the balcony, side to side. Raise your hand. God bless you, brother. Bless you, brother. God bless you, sis. God bless you, brother. How many others? Just raise your hand right now. Pray for me. Pray for me. That alone, that group alone, God bless you. I see you with your hands up. God bless your heart. That group alone should fill these altars immediately. If there's somebody not under the blood, somebody that's not been bought, and you need the Lord, it's not gonna save you. Would you raise your hand right now and say, pray for me, church. I need the Lord on the lower level, side to side. You'd raise your hand right now. I need to be saved. I need to accept the blood of Christ. I need to repent of my sins and ask the Lord into my life. Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me, preacher. Pray for me, church. Somebody like that? Up in the balcony, side to side. Somebody you need the Lord, you'd raise your hand. You say, what good would that do? What harm would it do? If I was lost, I'd want somebody praying for me. Somebody lifting me up in prayer. Would you do that right now? I need prayer. Pray for me. Pray for me. They're gonna sing, and as they sing, I know a lot of broken people raised your hands. I'll not talk anymore. If you need to pray, you come. You give it to God. God will hear you. God will bless you. The Lord loves you. He paid for you. You belong to him. Will you come right now? Come right on as they sing. Why don't you come? You come. Come right on. Come on. Empty and broken. Well, Lord. I came back well, Lord, to, to him. A vessel unworthy and so scarred with sin. But he did not despair. He started over again. And I bless the day he didn't throw the clay away. That's where he wants me to stay. Oh, but sometimes I will stumble and my vessel breaks. He just picks up all the pieces. He doesn't throw the clay away. Two. 
Now the sea is troubled And the night has been so long Out on the open water I'm praying for the the elders of the church to come. For the one who rules the tempest is standing at the wheel. I'm not afraid to trust Him as I face the raging sea. I don't message tonight. Did you enjoy that message? Thank you, Cal Ray. Thank you. Thank you for all that responded and for the spirit that we felt tonight. And it's just been one great day. I just want you to know, and we're hoping it flows right into tomorrow. Brother Alan Epinette will be preaching for us in the morning. 11th hour will be singing. I have one very important